Good morning and welcome to PepsiCo's 2023 first quarter earnings question and answer session. Your lines have been placed on listen only until it's your turn to ask a question. Today's call is being recorded and will be archived at www.pepsico.com. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ravi Pamnani, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations. Mr. Pamnani, you may begin. Thank you, Operator. I hope everyone has had a chance this morning to review our press release and prepared remarks, both of which are available on our website. Before we begin, please take note of our cautionary statement. We may make forward-looking statements on today's call, including about our business plans and updated 2023 guidance. Forward-looking statements inherently involve risks and uncertainties and only reflect our view as of today, April 25, 2023, and we are under no obligation to update. When discussing our results, we refer to non-GAAP measures, which exclude certain items from reported results. Please refer to our first quarter 2023 earnings release and Form 10-Q, available on PepsiCo.com, for definitions and reconciliations of non-GAAP measures and additional information regarding our results, including a discussion of factors that could cause actual results to materially differ from forward-looking statements. Joining me today are PepsiCo's Chairman and CEO, Ramon LaGuarta, and PepsiCo's Vice Chairman and CFO, Hugh Johnston. We ask that you please limit yourself to one question. And with that, I will turn it over to the operator for the first question. Thank you. Once again, in order to ask a question or make a comment, please press star followed by 1-1 one, one on your telephone. One moment for our first question. Our first question comes from Daryl Moschini with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, guys. Morning, there. So, um, very impressive price mix result in the quarter at 16%. Can you just give us an update on the competitive environment you're seeing in your key business segments and geographies, um, both in terms of just price increases, but also promotion, and if that's picking back up to more normalized levels, and uh, if that favorable environment is continuing, and just as, as you look going forward, obviously very strong levels of pricing. How do you think about the moderation of that back to more normalized levels going forward the next few quarters and the ability of volume to recover as that pricing dissipates on a year-over-year basis? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, there. Let me cover that, and then Hugh yeah. can, can, uh, can add some comments. Uh, we're seeing a... Um, a uh, competitive environment where we're all trying to uh, protect the health of the categories and then make sure that our brands are participating in those categories you know, in, in a competitive way. We're investing in our innovation, investing in our brands, uh, investing obviously in value in different ways, price and sizing mostly. So we're seeing a, a good, um, positive, competitive environment in, in the U.S., in, in Europe, and also in our developing market, so consistently across across the uh, across the world. When it comes to pricing, as, as we said earlier uh, in February, we have mostly uh, taken uh, the pricing already this year that uh, we we needed to uh, to cover for our cost increases, and uh, that that's it's where where we stand at this point. We're seeing uh, a deceleration of inflation, not a a, a reduction of, of cost, but a deceleration of inflation, and we think that with the pricing that we've uh, taken already in most of our business around the world, uh, that should be sufficient. Uh, obviously, there are some markets, uh, highly inflationary markets around the world, where we you know, might have to take uh, additional pricing. Um, you know, if you think about Argentina, Turkey, Egypt, those kind of markets where the currencies are. Are suffering, but but majority of our pricing is already done. Yeah, and the only thing I'd add to that, there, and as a reminder, uh, you know, we tend to buy commodities nine to twelve months out. Um, so, to the degree that uh, the the rate of inflation decreases, and and it, it will be a decrease in the rate of inflation, not not deflation by any stretch of the imagination. That's going to happen very slowly over the, the course of 23. I think that's more of a 24 thing to the degree it happens even then. Thank you. One more before our next question. Our next question comes from Andrew Tuck-Share with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. 
Good morning. Um, I wanted to go back to a little bit of what uh, you spoke on the prepared remarks that you were, and you also, on uh, an earlier interview here that you gave, um, that you're not seeing, um, you know, the fact that inflation is still, is still high throughout these six to nine months that, that you're seeing here. And it doesn't look like you, you're seeing the need for promotional um, environment, but more in the context of what has happened in LATAM, I think is the only reason region that you haven't seen a reacceleration, and every other region uh, you've seen an acceleration. And I'm seeing, <laughs> I'm talking, I'm asking this question more of the point of strength rather than a point of weakness. Of course, it's really hard not to to like the numbers here. Just thinking of how um, to think of the uh, volume um, decline you saw. Uh, in in snacks uh, and to think about how to um, how to parse it out, or it's more about the uh, the comparison getting tougher. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, Andrea. It's you. Uh, a couple things, just just for clarity, um, in terms of the the snack food or the the convenient food volume, uh, Pioneer was a big driver of that. Uh, you know, there there are challenges with with the power grid down in, in South Africa, and, and obviously Pioneer makes a lot of heavy products. Uh, X Pioneer snacks volume was basically flat for the quarter, uh, and beverages obviously was, was up a, a small amount for the quarter. Uh, in, in terms more broadly of uh, of sort of the 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 rate of uh, the rate of growth of of all of the businesses uh, from a, a revenue standpoint, I think generally speaking, you know, you you see the consumer uh, continuing to to buy our products. Uh, elasticities are still holding up quite well across most of the globe. Uh, and then, com- and you know, despite the fact that we're we're taking pricing driven by the inflation that that we're facing into. Uh, in terms of operating performance, I think what you're seeing more than anything is a reflection of the productivity initiatives that, that we've put into place, uh, whether they be automation in the supply chain or digitalization across the company or, or leveraging global business services. So it, when, when we talk about sort of a, an acceleration in, in the operating income performance, I think it's a consumer that, that's responding to the brand advertising we're doing and, and in addition to that, uh, the productivity that we're driving. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Kevin Grunny with Jeffries. Your line is open. Great. Uh, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, just picking up on, on the, some of your prior commentary there, and, and just the decision to raise the EPS guidance at this juncture of the year, uh, which I think is noteworthy because the, the, the company's delivery against guidance has historically been quite good, uh, as, as, you're, as you're well aware. But historically, the, the tact has been to maintain it and then as the year moves on to, to edge it higher. So I, I just, just some context here. Was it that the first quarter was, was that good relative to your expectations, just came in that much better? Because I, it, it's noteworthy within the context of all the prognostication around potential recession and market volatility for the raise at this juncture of the year. So maybe just some historical context around it and, and, and relative to the first quarter results, I think, would be helpful. So thank you. Yeah, Kevin, good morning. I think uh, you're right. Your, your, your assessment is, is right. Uh, we're seeing both uh, better elasticities than you know, some of the worst-case scenarios we were planning for. And uh, also we're seeing the teams um, delivering better productivity. So we're seeing, the, in general, the flow of materials, the availability of labor, transportation, all those elements that um, we're making as a suboptimal company, if you just to call it somehow, uh, in terms of operating metrics, that's getting better, which is giving us the opportunity to uh, up, you know, improve some of the metrics in our operations faster than what we thought. So it's both an improvement in productivity uh, on the cost side and better elasticity. I think the commercial programs were strong. You saw that we've increased A&M uh, again in the first quarter. Um, and I think the commercial plans, the innovation plans are very strong. So we feel comfortable that even – and we always play out a lot of scenarios before we give any – give you guys a guidance, uh, you know, we, we feel comfortable that even at this early point in the year, we can, we can raise our uh, top line and bottom line estimates. 
Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Bonnie Herzog with uh, Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I um, had a question on organic revenue growth at PB&A. Your price mix in the quarter was incredibly impressive, but your volumes were down slightly again. So could you touch on where you're primarily seeing the pressure and then you know, maybe what you're seeing from the consumer? Also, it seems that incremental pricing may be a bit harder to come by and promotional levels may need to increase in beverages this year. So. Could you touch on that as well as, you know, maybe your key initiatives to stabilize or turn your volume trends around at PB&A? You know, is your Pepsi rebranding or the new logo and visual identity for the brand, you know, one of those key initiatives, for instance? Thanks. Thank you, uh, Bonnie. No, we, we don't see, um, actually, uh, we, we see the momentum in the beverage category very strong uh, in terms of demand we're seeing away from home very strong. We're seeing the convenience channel very strong, and we're seeing most of the in-home channels also, you know, quite quite strong. So we, we don't feel that um, there's a competitive uh, environment that is getting worse in uh, in, in beverages. There, there's some uh, one-off in the um, in the uh, first quarter because we're, as you know, we're, we're moving Gatorade from a uh, warehouse system to a uh, DSD system. And in that in that transition, there is some inventory reduction overall in the system, and that that is impacting Q1. But um, you know, we, we we don't we don't think that the uh, competitive environment in beverages in the U.S. is getting worse, and that we need to do anything special. We have a very strong commercial program, both innovation, brands, commercial execution, and customer programs. So that will be the way we uh, we're planning to continue to compete vigorously in in the market. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Lauren Lieberman with Barclays. Your line is open. Great. Thanks. Good morning. Um, so when you've already been asked about, um, you know, raising the, the guidance early in the year, and it would sort of be mechanically hard not to, given how strong the quarter was. Um, but your your prior outlook you know, had baked in what we thought was one of the more conservative set of assumptions around the macro environment, at least for the second half of the year, um, across across our coverage anyway. And so I was just curious, you know, if you're seeing anything more recently that has you more optimistic on the macro trajectory, you know, anything in terms of that, you know, broader market outlook or consumer outlook that's informing, um, you know, your ability to raise the guidance, or is it really more tied to just the momentum in your own business? Thanks. Yeah, Lauren, it, it's mostly related to the fact that we're already, you know, one third of the year is is, is passed, and we, we have better information on on our costs and and everything else that uh, you know, complex operating. There there are a few things where we're still um, you know, concerned about. One is where's the consumer going to be in second half of the year? We continue to you know to be uh, have multiple scenarios and. And you know some of the scenarios are more optimistic, some less, and, and we continue to have various various scenarios. The second one, geopolitics, and that that might impact the business, and therefore we want to be cautious there as well. And the third one, as I mentioned earlier, there is some currencies in some uh, develop, emerging and developing markets that you know we don't know where some of those markets will go uh, in the second half of the year, and we we also want to make sure that we have the right. Um, you know, financial scenarios around those options. So those are the three variables that could define where the business goes. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, operationally the business is better. We're seeing better labor availability, better flow of materials. Suppliers are obviously getting better as well. Uh, transportation is getting better. So uh, operationally the business is in a better place than it was um, in 2022. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Brian Spang with Bank of America. Your line is open. Hey, uh, thanks, operator. Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, Hugh, I wanted to ask about uh, accounts payable. Um, just it was a pretty meaningful shift year over year. I understand there's a, a sequential or a seasonal piece to it, but I think it's up more than a billion dollars versus the first quarter last year. So. Is that tied to the Gatorade DSD 
uh, distribution change, or I don't know, is there something else going on with accounts payables that just is driving such a, a meaningful change? Yeah, hey Brian, uh, it, it's really two things. One is uh, uh, in seasonal inventory build on the Gatorade thing, as as you mentioned. Uh, the second is we we've got a number of uh, significant capital projects that are in flight right now, and the timing of the payables on on the capital uh, equipment is what drove that number. So I, I would take it as a one off, not not a not a change in trend by any stretch of the imagination. It's just a, a one off when the quarter ended. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Chris Carey with Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Um, can you maybe just touch on how um, investment priorities will evolve in 2023? I think one of the key takeaways from 2022 was, you know, distribution costs between shipping, handling, and merchandising activity was a key driver of you know, SGNA inflation, but I'm conscious of double-digit increases in added marketing spending out of the gates into Q1. So can you maybe just frame, you know, how, how overall investment will be evolving over the course of this year in the context of maybe some easing on inflation and certain SGNA buckets and, you know, an ability to, to put more spending in others? Thanks so much. Yeah, Chris, listen, uh, I think the framework of investment is similar uh, to what we've in the past, we, we I mean number one priority for us is to make sure that our categories remain highly visible in consumers' minds in a complex you know consumer choices uh, environment, and our brands do very well in that in those categories. So that's priority number one. Make sure that that we you know we continue to be the preferred brand with our consumers. Second, we continue to invest in transformation of the business, digitalization, and productivity. At the center of, of um, you know the uh, the strategy um, systems we've been investing on that for quite a while that continues to be an enabler of all the uh, data strategy that we have in the business and uh, th- those are the two two big big projects we continue to invest in capacity um, you know there there is uh, good volume growth across many of our markets around the world and that continues to be a priority in enabling the brands to continue to grow. So th- those are the principles. I don't know, Hugh, if there's anything else. No, I, I think that. that's right. The, the only thing, I, and, and I think to where, where Chris is going with the question from, from his perspective as well. Chris, I think you'll see more of the financial impact of those investments in SG&A, uh, significantly less so in cost of goods. So as, as you're modeling it out, SG&A is the place where you'll, you'll see all the items that Ramon uh, referenced uh, will be hitting. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Peter Grom with UBS. Your line is open. Thanks, operator, and good morning, everyone. So I I was hoping to get more color on the international performance in the quarter, but maybe specifically in China. I I know it was called out in the prepared remarks as a market where you gain share, and and, and maybe I missed this, but I don't think it was mentioned uh, when discussing growth in the quarter. So can you maybe share a view on the current environment in China, how that evolved through the quarter, and kind of how you see that progressing from here? Thanks. Yeah, good. Yeah, we're seeing obviously in China a uh, uh, optimism in consumers and uh, optimism in the customers, and that's that's driving volume for us um, across the um, across both uh, our food and our beverage business. The um, <clears throat> we're getting share on, especially in snacks. Snacks uh, has been performing very well through the pandemic and continues to uh, outgrow the category, and and in beverages as well. We're seeing competing quite well in colas and uh, it sports uh, hydration. So, um, yeah, obviously this is going to be a, um, a tailwind for, for us um, as the year progresses, um, both in away from home and in home uh, consumption. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Robert Ottenstein with Evercore ISI. Your line is open. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, given the strong start to the year and, and your confidence in the year, I thought I'd ask a, uh, a longer-term question. And, and that is, as, as you look at the categories that you're in, uh, you know, over time in the past, you've expanded in certain countries a little bit outside of beverages and snacks, uh, either for reasons of scale 
or growth opportunities, or maybe that's just you know what was available as as part of an acquisition. You know, over the next call it next five years or so, do you believe that you're in the right categories to drive your algorithm, or do you see uh, potentially the need uh, or desirability to you know expand into some adjacent areas, and given the uh, advances that you've made uh, in in IT and logistics, perhaps that's even even a, a greater opportunity than in the past. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great great question. Listen, I, we believe our categories are large and growing at a very fast pace around 5% uh, globally. Uh, I think our main responsibility is to maintain the innovation and make sure that the portfolio evolves with consumers, the brands continue to be super relevant. And, and you know, um, that, that is where we want to focus our efforts. We're making some small moves, as you saw, for example, when we're going into low alcohol here in the U.S., expanding the brands. We're making small moves like Cheetos going into Mac and Cheese. So we're expanding some of our brands. Uh, organically uh, in, into, uh, into some new spaces that make sense from the consumer point of view, um, that, that, uh, that we believe our categories are large, global, healthy, and we are responsible to keep them uh, healthy and growing very fast. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Vivian Azar with Cowan. Your line is open. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about Pepsi Zero Sugar, given the reformulation and the broad-based international distribution. Can you offer some perspective on how that's performing relative to expectations? And as well, um, could you possibly update us on how the organization is tracking towards your 2025 ESG target to drive 67% of volumes from lower added sugar beverages? Thank you. Thank you. Great question. And, and it's, it's essential to our strategy continue to drive uh, um, low sugar and non sugar products as uh, as you know kind of the um, the portfolio transformation uh, in in the case of Pepsi obviously that is very relevant for us given the size and scale of of Pepsi brand for us in the, the uh, relaunch in the u s with a new formula is very is being very well received by consumers based on our early early data of repeats and and preferences um, the the brand is growing. Sixty uh, percent, if I understand, if I remember correctly, in the first quarter, uh, and that's driven a little bit by distribution, but it's mostly velocity. Um, so uh, clearly, the consumers are, are um, you know, are, are, they like the product and they're coming back to the product. Uh, globally, we also see, um, you know, big growth of of the non-sugar segment in the category, two three times the average of the category in most of the markets. And we are we are driving that that growth along with some of our key competitors. It's a uh, I think it's a strategy that is working and is is keeping the category very relevant for consumers. We'll continue to invest in non sugar as a driver of um, of growth for our brands. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Gerald Pascarelli with Wet Bush. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Thanks for the question. In U.S. measured channels for salty snacks, we've seen private label products gain share of the overall category for the past few months now. Um, this is obviously happening in tandem with very strong performance and market share gains for Frito as well, which is great. Um, but was just curious if you've seen any near-term changes to broad consumer purchase patterns in this category relative to maybe a few months ago. Any thoughts that would be helpful? Thank you. Yeah, in general, we're seeing private label growth uh, in some of the categories where we participate, especially uh, waters, uh, juices that we used to participate in, in some, some categories in, in salty snacks, as well as you mentioned. You know, uh, as, you, as you well say, Frito-Lay is, uh, I think it's growing a share of market at the fastest pace that we've seen in the last maybe 10 years, if I recall. Uh, as a consequence of the, uh, the great work the team is doing in terms of uh, execution, but mostly innovation and brand building. So I, I think we see both private label uh, increasing, although from a very low base in solid snacks, 
but but most importantly for us, we're seeing our brands continue to uh, gain loyalty, expand the consumer base, and and uh, and be preferred in the in that segment. But yes, private label is slowly um, increasing, um, in in from a very very low base, as I said, in in some sub segments of the uh, of the salty snacks uh, business. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Brett Cooper with Consumer Edge. Your line is open. Good morning. Uh, with about a year in of Blue Cloud and Hard Mountain Dew, I was hoping you could provide some color on your view of the performance of the brand and the operation to date. Any learnings, and then and then how you think about proceeding from here. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, listen, we're, we're we're happy with the um, with the learnings that we're taking, uh, both in the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, the operation of this category, which is new to us, and also in how we create consumer demand and consumer loyalty, and we continue to, uh, you know, find partners to uh, to create new, um, new new solutions for for consumers with our brands. Um, we, you know, we just launched a um, a T version, a hard T version uh, with Lipton and Fifco Company. Uh, they develop a great product, uh, which we're going to start distributing through our system in the next uh, few weeks. Um, so we're going to go into the summer with two main products, uh, Mountain Dew, uh, Hard Mountain Dew, and Hard uh, Lipton. Um, as I said, we, our intention is not to build a large portfolio of products and complex portfolio, but is to focus on a few um, good brands uh, developed with uh, strategic partners and then leverage our uh, distribution capabilities to, um, to, you know, to give it to consumers all across the country. That, that's our, that's our journey. We're not rushing. We're going um, at a speed that we learn and we, and we, we make this business solid and with the right margins and the right, uh, the right consumer propositions. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Filippo Falorni with City. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, question on the Pepsi Beverage North America business. Um, it seems clearly this year you're making a lot of investments. Uh, the Pepsi logo change, the Starry launch, um, a lot of other launches, expansion of Pepsi Zero Sugar and Hard Mountain Dew. I just bigger picture, what are your expectations from kind of a market share standpoint in the business? What would you consider a success for this year? And then secondly, how do you balance these investments that you're making with your target of getting back to a mid-teens margin for the business? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, we, we've expressed this in the past. We, we want to have a business that uh, grows at the category pace or above and expands its margins to the mid-teens um, levels that we have uh, mentioned as well in the next uh, two to three years. That is the strategic intent for this business. I think the team is executing very well. Uh, the way we measure uh, our share is, is full LRB, so it's the full, full, um, you know, the full set of brands that we have in our portfolio, uh, not just small segments uh, within the category. And obviously, I think we're progressing well against that um, that growth target for the year, whilst also expanding the margins um, uh, for the for the business. You know, we feel good about the margin expansion this year. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our last question comes from Charlie Higgs with Redburn. Your line is open. Thanks for the question. Good morning, everyone. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the free to lay North America division and the volume growth there. How did Lay's, Doritos, Cheetos perform? Is there any color you can give on the single serve packs versus multi packs? And then just how you see the, the very strong margin growth in, in Q1 progressing throughout the year would be useful. Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, listen, uh, as I said earlier, uh, Free to Lay, I think it's in the U.S. and but, but also the whole snack business globally is doing extremely well. But if we if we focus on the U.S., I think the team is doing a fantastic job, growing the large brands as you mentioned, Lay's, Doritos, Ruffles, Tostitos, uh, Cheetos, and at the same time building peripheral brands that cover some spaces that that we you know we're not covering with the big brands. Let's call it uh, popcorners or sun chips, uh, smart food. We're, we're really building a, 
a portfolio of brands that covers different cohorts and different need states in a, in a unique way. Uh, we're also innovating in new formats. You mentioned multipacks, which has been a great hit for us in terms of variety and empowering consumers for personalization. But this year, uh, a few months ago, we launched Minis, which is also a, an incredible innovation if you think about the convenient the additional convenience it gives consumers um, and, and putting our best brands in that in that format opens a whole set of new occasions for the uh, for the business so we, we feel very good about the, um, the innovation strategy and how we keep capturing new occasions into our brands uh, as I said earlier I think the business is becoming better operationally as the supply of materials is getting better um, you know labor availability is getting better so we should uh, see um, you know, operational metrics improving, and that's where you're seeing in the margins, although the Q1 margin was a little bit elevated. Um, you know, the, the, the strategic intent with Frito-Lay is growing it very, very fast and keeping the margins at those high levels because that's super accurate for, uh, for the PepsiCo overall business. Okay, I think this is uh, the last question. So. Really appreciate the conversation this morning, and thank you, uh, everyone, for joining today, and especially for the confidence that you're all placing in our, in, our, in our company and the investments you're making in our company. Thank you very much, and have a, have a great day. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's presentation. You may now disconnect and have a wonderful day.